in high school you find your outlet and you find basketball. Mm -hmm. And what has the game given to you as a person? Wow, that's a deep question. I, I think everything. Franklin down though, nice pivot against Bales. Oh, took her to school. Banked it in for two. Taj, her chance. Got it. With 1.3 to play. Look, this is down low. And the shot is blocked by McWilliams Franklin. 40 years old, bringing the energy. Williams Franklin, ageless. Takes it in. So dropping it back, Simone. Here comes a triple try. It's off the iron, no good. Offensive rebound tight. Put back is good for the WNBA's all-time leader in offensive rebounds, Taj McWilliams-Franklin. She surpasses Yolanda Griffith for first all-time in WNBA history. Taj McWilliams-Franklin was a rare breed from the start. Although many children in America grow up with a single mom, Taj grew up with a single dad, who, although tough, shaped her into the woman she is today. For me, it's always about fire. I use that analogy a lot. And when you, you put coal in fire, it becomes a diamond. But it's never a diamond until it gets through that super hot temperature. And growing up, I was put into a super hot temperature and I couldn't melt it. But I slowly shined up and became a diamond. And just being a diamond is the hardest substance on earth. So knowing that I was able to help him and I had to do it, it just made me a better person along the way. Maybe not when you're thinking about at 12, you wanna go hang out with your friends and you have to come home and cook. You gotta come home and wash the clothes. You gotta come home and clean the house. Yeah, back then I was like, I wanna be with my friends too. But now I know that it was preparing me when I did have moments that I needed to be able to push through that I could push through. Um, my dad was never around because he was always working. So he worked two jobs, sometimes three, to put food on the table for us. And at the time, I was resentful for a lot of years. I resented that because I wanted to have someone there for me. I wanted to be able to not be older than I was. I wanted to be able to come home and play video games, Nintendo 64 at that time, and, and play Mario Brothers with my brother on the, Mario Luigi, but I couldn't. And I resented it for a long time until I realized that my dad was preparing me to be able to take care of myself and my family the only way he knew how. And for me, that's a big up. I always hear um, all the star athletes like, mom, love you, mom. And for me, it was always my dad and it always will be my dad. And it just made me tough because I don't stress about small details. And I don't stress about being able to tell me straight up what you need, if, whether it hurts my feelings or not, I get over it and I owe a lot of who I am and the toughness that I exhibit from my dad. And I, I never can say that enough. Like, yeah, I love my mom, she's a nice lady, but my dad made me this player, this heart, the drive to be successful and to never give up. Taj would need that drive more than ever out of high school when she was faced with being a mother at only 17. I thought I would let down a lot of people. Um, I thought I had, I thought I had messed up my future. I had a lot of negative, negative, negativity being spoken into my life about it. Um, and I was given the option of not continuing my pregnancy. And I just felt like who I was, that that responsibility was on me. Like there's no easy way um, to be a teenage mom and to be ready for that. But I refused to shirk my duties because I made a mistake. A, child, a child's life is not the cost of one mistake. And so for me, it was always about you own up to what you do. It's your responsibility as a human being. Um, it's not about pro-choice, it's a pro-life. It's just about my responsibilities as a person, my responsibilities as a mother. I chose that path. The baby didn't decide to choose it for me. So for me, owning up to that and saying, yes, I did it and I'm gonna raise my child and I'm gonna be a mom was important for me. And, and that's what I chose to do. The choice to raise a daughter proved more difficult than Tosh had ever imagined. For the 4.0 high school student, after her announcement, over 100 college offers began dropping off the table, one by one. However, one school still kept their promise. But Georgia State um, said, we're gonna stick with you because it's about a human issue, not about a basketball issue. And uh, I, I was afraid that because I was so new that I wouldn't be able to overcome having a baby and then playing in, in college and a career because it just, at that time, it, it just never happened. 
Like I was one of the first people that ever played and had my kid at school. And so I, I'm pioneering, you know, the teenage mom in college still, and there's no support, absolutely zero. My dad was through with me, he was like, right, you messed up your life, your career, right, you could have been a great basketball player. Um, my high school coach stuck with me, but I was finishing high school. And so I get to college and I have no support whatsoever. And uh, at the time it was new. So my college coach who wanted me there got fired midway through the season because we were losing. Um, and a new coach came and she made it clear that I was not going to be on her team with my baby and that maybe I could give her to my mom and, and I just wouldn't do that because it's my responsibility. And so I ended up leaving Georgia State um, and I went to live with my mom, found out I was pregnant again. Um, and decided that I was just gonna stay and work, that basketball wasn't worth it because I hadn't felt any type of um, support in the basketball arena for my special situation. And uh, after my coach left at Georgia State, it was just all downhill. There was no support after that, like nothing. And so uh, I worked for a while and I decided to give my, daughter, my middle daughter up for adoption um, because I knew I couldn't make it with both of them and I, and I had to do what was best for her. Um, not so much what was best for me because at the time it, it tore me in half. Um, but knowing that what I know now, it was the, the greatest decision I probably could have made for her. And perhaps the best decision for Tosh herself. With two kids, no support, and working at a yogurt shop, she turned to the church, which inadvertently led her back to her real temple, the hardwood. Well, ended up, someone who was at my church at the time I was telling her about going to this school and she was like, well, we got money at our school. And I was like, Ugh, I don't know about that. And she was like, no. She told me her story. She had the exact same story as mine. She had went to University of Texas at Austin. She had gotten pregnant. At the time, Jody Conrad had decided that no kids were allowed there. She had put her daughter up for adoption and then went back to play, but could no longer stay there because of the atmosphere and giving her baby up. So she went to this NAIA school, St. Edwards, and that's where she was at. And so after I learned her story, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll go just because we have similar stories. It was the best decision I ever made. Like they, I call it the community of athletics. They looked beyond my situation and saw humanity, the humanity that they showed me. I mean, she literally was in classes with me because I couldn't afford to have her. She would be in the athletic secretary's couch sleeping because I couldn't afford to pay when I had to go to a class that wouldn't allow me to take her. Um, I, I would take a midterm and be sitting outside of the door while everybody else were in the class so she could run around outside so she wouldn't be bothering. I mean, this, this was a university that did that, a, a real life university that allowed me to, to see that it was more than just basketball. It was about me and a person and helping someone. And, for me, that was the true definition at the time of humanity. Like, because I hadn't experienced that before. Everything had been, choose this or do this. Do this or do this. It wasn't, what do you want to do? And we'll support whatever it is you choose. And uh, I mean, I got offers after the first year, you know, I was all everything in NAIA. And then people were like, oh yeah, come play a D1 school, leave there. And I just, you don't repay loyalty with leaving. And I just couldn't, I said, I won't. Taja's loyalty paid off. In her time at St. Edwards, the team won three conference titles, and in 1993, she was a Kodak All-American. A few journeyman years overseas and in the ABL led her to the WNBA, where in 1999, she was drafted by the Orlando Miracle in the third round. But the hard work didn't stop there for Taj, who attributes her success to her blue-collar attitude. And for me, it was always that first title. I'd toiled so long overseas, so long in the ABL, so long in the WNBA, and you know, I'm the quintessential good girl. I'm the, the good guys always finish last, and that's how I felt. Like everything I did kind of meant nothing until I won the title, until I was able to help a team win a title. And so I guess if I do think about it in that terms, it's always that first title in Detroit with the shock. Um, I was just overcome with emotion, and, and I'll always remember that. So after finally reaching the mountaintop, what exactly was she feeling in that moment? It was, it was the closest to being a mother, the feelings of overwhelming emotion that I, I've ever had, besides 
having my children. Like that moment was just like, it was like a baby, like giving birth. It took me 11 years to give birth to that baby. And so it was just like, wow, I'm a champion. So after my name, yeah, great leader, humanitarian, all the stuff in the community, work champion. hard, champion. Like that, that's something that no matter how many, people can say they're now, this next person is the best offensive rebounder, all time leading scorer. But you can never change that in 2008 in the WNBA for the Detroit Shock, my name under the other 12, and I'm always going to be a champion. And in 11, you won another one yes. with the Lynx. Yes. And you've played with some really, really great players. I mean, Maya Moore, Lindsey Whalen, Candace Wiggins, you, you name them, Simone Augustus. What have you learned from them? I mean, you said you've been a, a, a mother to them. What have you learned from them? I think <laughs> youth has its advantages. Um, <laughs> I'll say that for a long time, being the older player was kind of like a disadvantage for me because I was expected to be a leader. I was expected to kind of take care of the young players. I was expected to teach them. And I think and when I went to Minnesota, I was expected to do those things, but I was also able to just have fun and enjoy because they were all so young. And a lot of times I'm always so serious because I'm always thinking through things that being young and free and just enjoying the moment, that's what I learned from them. I was able to just enjoy being there in that moment in my life and being happy and winning a title with people that I genuinely liked and respected outside of basketball players. And that for me, 2011 summed that up. Just youth, youth has its advantages. Be fun, have, be passionate, love what you're doing for that moment because it's never gonna come around again. And they respected you a lot. I mean, they had a nickname for you. <laughs> Mama Todd. <laughs> Candace Mama Wiggins. Todd. What does that nickname mean to you? And so for me, when Candace Wiggins gave me that, it was a term of endearment for her because I was, she was able to come to me in times of need, times of extreme pain, extreme joy, um, questioning certain things about things, and just wanting to sit down and talk, and sometimes just needing a hug. Like, everything's going to be OK. So for me, it encompasses everything that I've ever done within basketball and, and it was kind of like at first I kind of bristled because I'm not anyone's I'm not old enough to be 20 people's mom and I would have fans come in like mama Taj I'm like no I'm not your mama Taj yeah, <laughs> no you're like 80 I'm like 30 30 40 at the time but um, I, I sort of embraced it because when she she told me she's like no you're like my mom away from my mom I, I need you here with me and then just accepting it. You accept it, and, and I am. I've, I've been a mom since I was 18, so for me, it's a natural extension of who I am. And Mama Taj on the court has transitioned seamlessly to Mama Taj on the sidelines. Coaching was always something people told me I would do well. People would always be like, you'd be a great coach, just because of the way I view the game. I view the game in segments. I don't see like some people play and they're just like, oh, I played. I didn't know I was going to do that. For me, I view and it allows me to play better and see things that other people won't, probably won't see because they, they allow other things to cloud them. In Minnesota, my coach Reeve used to have me in with her and the rest of the coaches going over the strategies for the games and who, what do I think about that? And so I've always had that told to me you'd be a great coach you see the game so well you don't see it as a player you see the game as a coach and so for me it was a natural extension of wanting to still mentor and be part of the game and that's what I want to teach the girls that the fundamental base you have no matter tall short thin big lefty righty post guard though that fundamental base will stay with you throughout your career no matter what I mean I was nine months pregnant playing basketball and I played well it, it's the fundamental aspect. You don't have to jump. You don't have to be skinny. You, you never lose that. I can shoot 30 shots in my sleep. And so for me, basketball and coaching became an extension, like coaching basketball. Why wouldn't I? Why, why can't I? All of this stuff that's in there has to be for something besides just getting older and forgetting it. Um, and to me, it's sharing. I, I'm a giver. And, and I'm a firm believer in having someone who is a mentor. I didn't have women mentors growing up in the sport. Um, and so I want to be that. I want someone to be able to come to me and pick my brain and say, hey, 
I want to learn how to do this move. Can you teach me? Because I can. Even if I'd never used it, I can. And that's what coaching has been, like just a natural extension of, of giving back to the sport that gave me so much. And so when I looked at BU, I said, oh, great history. America East, many, many times they were in the NCAAs. They moved to a new league, a new conference, not so good a history. Good place to start. And just looking through the roster, like this is a, not a traditional basketball team as far as there's not six, three centers and there's not super quick athletic guards. That's me. I'm an undersized center all my life. I've played bigger than what I am. Can I then teach that to some of the kids here? And then finally, it was just coach setting. Um, I, I played against her in the ABL, the first league. Um, I watched her in the Olympics. Uh, when I tried out for the Olympics, I remember her being there. Just everything about what she stood for, I wanted to be a part of. And so for me, uh, I've moved to different places so I can take different, glean different things from the leaders there. And you talk about it, you talk about legacy and at the end of the day. So at the end of the day, Taj McWilliams Franklin, the basketball player, the mother, the lover, the woman with faith, the roamer, how do you want everyone to remember you at the end of the day? Just true. I think the true Taj, the passion, the love of life. There's always, I think, uh, about people who write their own obituary before they die, and they always say what they want to have in that. And they always, sometimes it's flowery, sometimes it's specific. And I always think about that. If today was the last day, would I be okay with who I am and what I've left behind? And what would people say about me? And I think for me, it's always that passion the love and the truth. And those are, that's how I live. My daughter, I, I, I say everything that I do, all my emails at the end, it's love, it's cry, it's breathe, it's pray. That's, that's life. And she has a tattoo of that in, in Italian on her because it, that's the truth. You love, and Jimmy Valvano says it, and I have one of his quotes, but if you take a moment every day to laugh, to cry, and, and to live for me, you've, you've lived a full life. And that's what I think people will say if at the end of the day, that authentic, true passion for whatever it was. And that's, that's what I want to make sure my kids know that, my husband, but people that meet me, they're always drawn to something about me. And it's always the same. I'm like, I don't know what it is. And it's just because I, I'm true. This, this is on the court, off the court, bad day, good day. I am happy to be here and to be in this position. And I think it shines through. And that's what I want to leave behind. That's my legacy.